Another live, Martin Luther King Day. You are inspiring me to be here, Martin Luther King. <sighs> Think about that for a second. What inspires you about Martin Luther King Day? Hello and welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's YouTube Live Monday, freeze to flirt. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Give me a like. Please say something in the chat so that way I know if this is on and working. I would love to know that this is on and working. So welcome. Can you hear me? Throw something in the chat for me. Let me know if you can see me or hear me because I would love to know. Okay, I got a thumbs up. I think it's working. There's a few people here I'm saying, Hello, hello, hello. It is Martin Luther King Day, and I'm going to ask you what, if anything, inspires you from Martin Luther King and how that man lived his life. Type it in the chat. Tell me. Share with us all so that we can share goodness and inspiration. Or for whatever reason, he didn't work for you. Share that too. All of you is welcome here, but let me know in the chat what inspires you about Martin Luther King and how he lived his life. And what I want to share with you is driving to my office this morning. Every morning I listen to something called Darren Daly. Darren Hardy is a high success business coach. And he talks a lot about the compound effect and it's doing something every day, whether you want to or not whether you're feeling it or not, because that compound effect over time yields results. So I'm listening to Darren Daly. He talks about, uh, this is an interesting example of the compound effect. Would you choose option A or option B? Option A, would you choose to get $10 million today? Option B, would you rather have a penny doubled for a month? And if you choose option A, great, you have $10 million. If you choose option B and you double a penny every day, by 31 days, you'll have over $11 million. And so he talks about the compound effect and little things that you do build and build like a snowball over time and yield really great results. So I'm driving in this morning listening and he's talking about Martin Luther King and he shares this story about Martin Luther King and how he was giving the closing talk at um, a four day conference. And it was, you know, promoting peace in the world and nonviolence. And everybody's there dressed up in their Sunday best, all these, you know, suits and ties and Lutheran ministers. And this white guy is sitting in the sixth row amidst a sea of predominantly black people dressed up really nice. And he's just wearing a white t-shirt. Some guy, six foot two, halfway into the talk, he gets so pissed off at what Martin Luther King is saying because he's actually uh, working for, you know, the bad guy, whatever that is, Ku Klux Klan. I don't know. He gets up onto the stage in front of tens of thousands of people and starts punching Martin Luther King in the face, just slugs him. Martin Luther King, five foot seven against a six foot two, like Nazi guy, struggles back and, and comes back around and stands face to face with this guy getting ready to punch him in the face again. And Martin Luther King just looks him in the eye and drops his hands down by his side like a baby and communicates what Jesus and so many other peaceful people have preached, like turn the other cheek. He actually did it. And I, I bring that here today because I'd love to hear from you. How does Martin Luther King inspire you? And what that story tells me is that in order to become the person we want to become and live the life we want to live, we often have to do counterintuitive things things that don't come naturally to us. If somebody were to punch me in the face, last thing I would do is stand up and calmly face them in a vulnerable, exposed position. 
Gandhi inspires you. Absolutely. Boxing and bulldogs face the uncomfortable. Yeah. And facing the uncomfortable is exactly what we need to do and are called to do every day. And I think the way that we face the uncomfortable can be wired into our system in ways that promotes confidence or promotes burnout. If we're always facing the uncomfortable, doing the things we don't want to do in like a really tense, rigid, tight, stiff body, it, it wires it in and we get burnt out. And um, if we can face the uncomfortable, like, and take some breaths in between and surrender, I think it goes a lot better. So happy Monday, everybody. Do you have today off? Yes or no? Are you working? Martin Luther King Day. Are you working today? Are you not working? What's happening? Today, freeze to flirt. I want to talk a little bit today more about a map on, on how to do that. Last week, somebody asked me a gorgeous question, a difficult, beautiful question about what does one do with hopelessness? And I've been thinking about that a lot this week. And... I want to talk to that, and I want to use a map. Boop, ba, da, boo. This is something that I use in talks often. It's inspired by Mark Brackett. He founded the Yale Center of Emotional Intelligence. And Mark Brackett, in his research, came up with this. This is my more handy dandy version of it here. It's what he calls the mood meter. It's research evidence-based. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about how do we actually shift using this map from freeze to flirt. And oftentimes we are frozen in hopelessness to speak to last week. And I... I really like this map. You can't see it here, and it's not yet uploaded onto my website. But if it's interesting to you and you want a copy, I would be happy to email it to you. So go ahead and shoot me an email at info at greentreemind.com, and I will personally send you a copy of this. It is a version of Mark Brackett's mood meter. He wrote the book, permission to feel. I give him lots of credit and gratitude for creating this mood meter. And so we're going to talk today about how I use this and how you can use it too. So what I like about this is it's colors and numbers. Hopelessness is a place where many of us, myself included, can get stuck. Have you ever gotten stuck in a feeling? And what feeling was it? Put it in the chat. Willene says, last week we went through the mood meter and she said it was amazing. And yeah, give me a call and go through a session. Willene gives me the thumbs up. Thanks, my friend. It is, it's really amazing what we can do here with this mood meter. And I have really amazing examples. In fact, just last week, a woman came in and it was her first session with me and she has persistent knee pain in her um, patellar tendon anytime she tries to jump or do a loaded squat. And this started three years ago when she was doing some new martial arts training and she's seen seven different therapists. She doesn't want to have surgery. It's not a surgical problem. And she's starting to recognize, I think my nervous system is involved with this. And so we did some work with this mood meter last week, and it started with recognizing that she and you and me, all of us, we're like a human gobstopper. You remember that candy when you were young, the gobstopper, it's like got all these layers and I live in Denver, Colorado, and just over there is this thing called Dinosaur Ridge. And you can see the different layers of the earth 
it's like stratus stratus something you can study type it in the chat if you know what it is um so yeah i i think when i work with people i think about them like they have these different stratas and we can do this on zoom or in person like willene says so this woman comes in, she's got knee pain, and traditionally, it's like, go straight to the knee pain, do some objective testing. And I said, yep, absolutely, we're going to get there. But before we got, I just want to do an assessment with your nervous system. And so she walks into my office, and I said, this is a weird thing, but I'm just going to have you pause and look around for a minute and just do a pulse check and kind of notice is anything in this space that is dangerous. Is there anything in this space that doesn't work for you? Is there anything in here that's uncomfortable or unpleasant? And the reason why I ask is because I want your nervous system to know that its needs matter here. And if there's something that isn't working for your nervous system because it's being perceived as a threat, we can change that. And so she's like, oh, no, it's fine. And that's probably what most of us would say. It's fine. And we talked for a little while, got to know one another. And about 20 minutes in, she said, you know what? Can I turn that clock around? Because just looking at the time is making me anxious. And I said, absolutely. So as we were together in the session, we kind of got down a couple layers into her human gobstopper, right? That stratus layer of the nervous system deeper down was perceiving a threat in the room with time. And so she turned the clock around and instantly relaxed and her nervous system dropped down in anxiety, like three points, which is pretty cool. And so I said, that's really good. And I'm glad you felt safe and comfortable enough to do that. And as we sit with our nervous system, we can sink down into deeper layers of our human gobstopper and the different strata. And so then it was like, okay, can we do something objectively to test my knee? And I said, absolutely. Um, I have a, a weight over here. And I'm going to ask you, when I invite you to think about picking up the weight to do a squat, what do you notice in your nervous system? And she said, it, it, you know, first pass is, it's fine, because that's what I was going to say, because that's what I've always said. But now that I know how to like sink down into that deeper strata, it's actually like a nine out of 10 level of anxiety at the thought of picking up the weight. And these, these deeper strata in our human gobstopper affect our conscious reality. And it was driving her experience of pain. And so she ended up leaving that day with homework of just standing, holding a weight and noticing what was happening in her body. And so as she was standing there, she was feeling a constriction in her throat, a tightness in her chest, and so much anxiety, like eight out of 10. And I said, yeah. It's good to be aware of that. Your nervous system is having a subconscious response that we are making conscious. And until you're aware of that, you can't change it. So her homework is to go home and practice settling and lowering the arousal level of our nervous system while holding a weight. We're not even squatting it. So to bring all of that to the mood meter, Mark Brackett's work. By the way, I'm guessing these stories, they're bringing up something for you. Talk to me. What is this making you think of in your world? Your own layers of your human. Do you have things lower down in the deeper layers of your nervous system that might be tumultuous, unpleasant, and causing problems on your superficial conscious experience of life? Just hearing these stories is probably bringing something up for you and making you think of something. What is it? I would love to hear. And I'm clearly clear that 
you may not want to share because I'm a weirdo. Like, why would I want to share with somebody going, I should probably look at you more like Martin Luther King, like that peacefulness, like that invitation of do what you need to do because on some level you're hurting. So anyway, Mark Brackett's mood meter. There's one to 10 pleasant down at the bottom and one to 10 energy on the side. So it's like an X and a Y axis. And you've all heard the terminology, name it to tame it, maybe not. But there's words in each of these colors, which you probably can't see. Uh, so you should email me <laughs> and I'll get you the chart because it's super helpful. So one to 10 energy, low is one and 10 is high. That doesn't mean it's good or bad. It's not that low is bad and high is good. It's just that our nervous system is designed to move between low states and high states. And we need the lower states to do things like eat and sleep and heal, recover from difficult things in life. So we need low energy. And we also need high energy to do hard things, to work out, to tackle projects you might not want to tackle, have conversations you might not feel comfortable with. Like we need high energy to increase energy and enthusiasm and motivation. We also need high energy to do things like fight or flight. And we also need low energy to do things like eats. All of those are life giving mechanisms. So that's energy, high and low, one to 10. Now, how many of you are used to going to a medical doctor and they say, what's your pain? One to 10. I find that the least helpful and most offensive question that any healthcare provider could ever ask you because it's so one dimensional and limiting in its helpfulness. And I understand why we do it. I'm not knocking or it's not my intention to berate the medical healthcare system. I just find that if you ask good questions, you get good answers. And if you don't ask good questions, you don't get good answers. So I don't think one to 10, what's your pain is a helpful question. I think what's your pulse check is a helpful question. And so I need two dimensions because one to 10 gives me a very narrow amount of information. But when you have an X and a Y axis that are both measuring one to 10, then suddenly I'm getting a lot more information. So there's energy and there's pleasant. One to 10 pleasant. In any given moment, what is your energy right now? One to 10, if you were to do a pulse check on your nervous system, how would you rate it? I would say my energy right now is about a four or a five. And I want to hear from you. Energy one to 10, what is your pulse check right now? This is a map that can help you shift from freeze to flirt with life, engage with life. You can't get where you want to go if you don't know where you're at. And where is your nervous system at? And there's deeper layers of it too. So start with the layer that you're at. Walene is saying my feet have hurt on and off. And since the exercise, since the exercise with you and the exploration um, I have found is that my feet hurt when I think about or worry more about something I have to do. And that's such a brilliant thing, right? Like Wuleen's a seven and energy that tends to be more high energy. And she's putting together since using this mood meter that when she's thinking about, I have to do something, her feet are hurting. Wow, that's fantastic information. Don't have surgery on your feet because it won't work. Just a thought. So Wuleen's a seven out of 10 energy. Okay, now, Willine, one to 10, where would you rate your pleasant? Okay, now, this is a really interesting idea here. And I, I diverted a little bit from Mark Brackett's work, depending on which meter you read. But he has typically 
At least many things do. Oh, you're nine on Pleasant, Willine. So Mark Brackett organizes it, or some people, I don't know if it's always Mark Brackett, where six, seven, eight, nine, ten are pleasant, and one through five are unpleasant. And I want to say more about that in a moment here, but nine for Willine. So she's got a nine in the pleasant, and she's got a seven in energy. And so she would be according to here in this nice yellow box. And the word that goes along with that is proud. And Willene, I'm wondering, does that word resonate with you? Does that land with you as true? Boxing and Bulldogs is feeling at least a seven. I'm super curious. So you think a seven, you're doing well. Are you talking about energy or pleasant? Is your energy a seven? Is your pleasant a seven? Which one? And what's the other one? And yeah, Willene, proud works. It's a good day. I love it today. Proud is, is a good word. So boxing and bulldogs is seven on pleasant. So one to 10 over here, seven. So boxing and bulldogs is somewhere up and down this line. Okay, so seven for his pleasant and uh, his energy is a nine. So that word up here in this yellow box again is cheerful. Coffee still working, boxing and bulldogs. Does the word cheerful resonate with you? Does that land as true for you? So here's what I think is pretty profound. And I'm gonna sidebar over to something um, an idea from a book called Super Better, where she says, we don't get better from something, we get better at something. Yeah, that works. Cheerful. All right. Boxing and Bulldogs, I'm cheerful along with you. I can tap into some yellow energy and I can tap into proud. So the two people contributing, thank you, cheerful and proud. Mirror neurons are real, like that yellow energy here gives us information about where their nervous system is at. All right, so here's why I think super better is relevant. Super better. You don't get better from something, you get better at something. So I don't get better from insomnia, I get better at sleeping. Now, many of us, myself included, are trying to get better from some kind of pain, whether that's physical pain or emotional pain or social pain. I think of pain in a very three-dimensional way, not just physical or mechanical, but how does this physical pain connect to emotional pain or social pain because they run pretty identical circuits in the brain. So we don't get better from pain. We get better at the opposite of pain, right? I don't get better from insomnia. I get better at sleeping. On some level, the opposite of pain is pleasure. So if I want to get better from pain, I need to get better at pleasure, and that's why I really like this chart here where the whole of this is pleasure. So if we look at this blue quadrant, low energy, low pleasant, we have words like hopeless. We have words like morose, depressed, discouraged, sad, bored, tired, sleepy, drained despair, pessimistic, disgusted, glum, alienated, down, apathetic. This is typically a bleh, like an unpleasant place to be. So that's blue. And there's the idea of name it to tame it. If you are here, that's a normal part of the human condition. All of these are normal and natural and necessary parts of your wholehearted human life. And if you happen to be in blue, 
one thing you can do is start to name it and put words correctly on exactly what you're feeling because language, when you put a word to it, name it to tame it, it helps to start bring that physiology into a greater state of regulation. And so that's what this blue quadrant is about. The red quadrant is very high energy, but also still lower pleasant. And so up in red, we have words like anxious, panicked, stressed, jittery, shocked, stunned, worried, apprehensive, troubled, concerned, enraged, livid, fuming, repulsed, uneasy, peeved, irritated, annoyed. All of these things, again, are normal, natural, and necessary parts of the human experience. They do tend to be less pleasant. And even me, while talking about them, I'm running those circuits and I'm present to their energy. You might be present to their energy. If you're a sensitive, can you feel this energy while I'm talking about it? It's not always easy, but we don't necessarily get better from the pain of them. We get better at the pleasure of them. So I wanna give you an example. This morning, I actually woke up really down I was feeling very low energy, super apathetic, and just didn't fucking want to do this YouTube live, to be perfectly honest. And the like resentment and the resistance was really high. And I would call that pain. Now, I can't get better from pain, but I can get better at pleasure. And so how do we do that when we're stuck in a tunnel vision, one dimensional world of pain? Well, what I did is I forced myself to think one to 10 pleasant. What is this? I couldn't orient to any kind of pleasure. And so I said, all right, well, I'm in eight or nine out of 10 pain here, which then means if I'm in eight or nine out of 10 pain, eight or nine means there's one or two pleasant. And so then I automatically know, okay, I'm in one to two out of 10 pleasant. It doesn't feel pleasant, but I need to start shifting my perspective out of trying to get better from pain and instead get better at pleasure. And so I forced myself to think, okay, this moment right now, I'm feeling one out of 10 pleasure here, maybe two. And it's interesting how over time repeated, my shifting in my system is like really happening because the whole of my human experience is getting more and more pleasant because I'm getting better at orienting to what is pleasant instead of resisting the pain and trying to get better from the pain. And so this is a, a drastic shift here to orient to all of your life as pleasant so that you can get better at pleasant, which ultimately lets you get better from pain. But without trying to get better at pain, you're just simply building trenches in your nervous system in a different direction. So... That's why I think it's really advantageous to have a two-dimensional thing, and especially this lower dimension on pleasant, to have the whole thing be oriented as pleasant, is because it really has a profound effect on our ability to recover from circuits of pain that can hold us captive. I wanna take a pause. And I'm thirsty and I have no water around because it's across the room because I'm sitting in a different place. Why? Because this morning I was feeling lower pleasant, lower energy, right? Like when I think back to this morning, it was like a one or two pleasant and a three or four energy. And so I was feeling miserable and pessimistic about YouTube and, and this time 
And, and because there's lower energy here, I ran late. And that's why my water bottle's on the other side. So me having this here this morning in a lower down stratosphere has effects. And they're not good or bad or right or wrong. It's just, wow, cause and effect. Noticing when I wake up in blue, it leads to me not having water when I'm thirsty here on this YouTube live. But there's a piece that I didn't connect to yet that I think is really important. And when we have habitual blue energy, it can carve like feedback loops in our brain and body and body and brain. And I feel confident in my ability to get out of blue. And in fact, I already did, right? Like I was yellow earlier with Willeen and Chris and I did a walk at the park and like I felt other things. And that's one of the things that's important is to remember like when you're in blue and feeling very one dimensional blue and it gets wired in. <laughs> Jen, you're awesome. Thank you. I will go grab my water in a second here. Um, see, look at that right there. Jen's comment to me, eight out of 10 pleasure for energy. Jen, I'm going to take a second here. Eight out of 10 pleasant for energy. Satisfied. Absolutely. I feel satisfied. Jen B, thank you for influencing me in that way because I do. And now look at me. I have energy. I'm going to go get my water bottle. And now I'm going to have a drink because look at that. I feel very satisfied right now. Jen B gave me permission with flowers and little prayer. And Jen B just affected my nervous system and it, it hit into a layer I suddenly have way more energy. I'm at like an eight in my energy now and a good six or seven in pleasant. So eight, energized, six, pleasant, totally, absolutely, thank you. We affect one another. And these layers of our nervous system are constantly changing and moving on this map. Just like Willine's saying, like, when we change how we think and what we're doing, we can call different things into our life. I'm now a healthier human because I'm drinking water. But we get so stuck. Allison, thanks for that comment. I love it too. And I love that I'm here with you. And it's because of people here giving me information we can shape and mold and co-regulate together and create more diversity, um, not diversity, flexibility in the ability to travel between these different colors. So somebody asked me, how we, how do we shift out of hopelessness? Name it to tame it. Where is hopeless? It's a too pleasant. Okay. So it's low pleasant and that's fair. High pain, low pleasant, start orienting to it through the lens of pleasant instead of pain and start to name it. And here's what happens to so many. Kyla, good to see you live in a chat. I wish I could see your face moving around and have a conversation. Thanks for being here. See, look again, Kyla, boom, more pleasant. I'm, I'm up at like an eight or a nine now. And the energy is like a five or six, eight or nine, five or six, Hopeful, focused, playful, proud. Which one of those words match, right? Kyla's affected my nervous system. These things change moment to moment to moment, but we can get stuck in a rut, a neurological groove from brain to body and body to brain. And we can just constantly fall back into this, what I call hopeless pit of despair, right? Like, Hopeless and despair are one and two pleasant with low energy, one energy. And this pit is a place I know well, my irritable bowel syndrome comes from there. 
my back pain comes from there. My sciatica comes from there. My migraine headaches come from there. I think fibromyalgia, autoimmune, like all of these tricky, sticky, long-term problems come from that hopeless pit of despair that's wired itself in from brain to body and body to brain. And it becomes like a rut. It becomes like a groove. It becomes like the trail at Cheeseman Park that everybody walks, even though the pavement is right over there. We walk here because that's what's gotten chemically comfortable and very familiar. And so then what happens is this is so bad that we try and boom up out of it and end up in a whirling dervish of fury and anxiety and frustration. And then that gets exhausting. So then we sink back down and we end up in this autonomic roller coaster of dysregulation that feels very bipolar and exhausting to people because it's just an autonomic regulation pattern hopeless pit of despair, get out, get into rage, fury, anxiety, worry. That's not sustainable. So here, so people end up with this groove stuck in their nervous system. What's the way out? Dig trenches of truth and orient to other avenues. And that takes repetition and it takes focused attention. 12 seconds at a time is a way to wire that in. How do you do that? Through co-regulation experiences, mirror neurons, my friend. When I yawn, you yawn. When you are stuck here and you see other people over here, but they can match you here. That's a beautiful way to start training your nervous system to find other tracks. But here's a common thing that happens. This bottom corner blue is bad. So I try to go up here. Or I'm like, no, I want the pleasant. I want the yellow and green. The words like enthusiastic and peaceful and cheerful and playful and balanced. So I try to do things to get me here. But I don't have a riverbed in my nervous system dug in that can hold it. And even though this sucks, I'm chemically comfortable here. So then we end up self-sabotaging because we want to be here, but our nervous system can't hold it because a deeper layer in the stratosphere of your human gobstopper is stuck in a rut. So this map can orient you to things that are happening inside of you. Willene never thought about the nervous system being the regulator. And now that she's working with me, she's making better choices about everything, how she's feeling, the people that she's with, the things she does, how her nervous system is feeling. Yeah, you can't change it if you're not aware of it. And this is a great map to start getting aware of what is happening in the riverbed of your nervous system. And what is your most familiar self? right? Like that autonomic dysregulation roller coaster is oftentimes very chemically comfortable and familiar to people. And they have to dig the trenches into other things. And so here's my dilemma that I've been working on for a long time now is waking up with that hopeless pit of despair. And because I don't have the words specifically to name each box, my brain has generalized that all blue is bad. And so suddenly, if I'm feeling sad or bored or apathetic or tired, fatigued, I go straight into that hopeless pit of despair. And there's a beautiful line in Kelly Clarkson's song, Broken and Beautiful. And she's like, I'm tired. Can I just be tired without feeling sad and hopeless and out of time? And what she's saying there is that I'm tired, right? Five pleasant, three energy. I'm tired. Can I just stand in this box without spinning out like Bambi on ice into that hopeless pit of despair and then, ah, panicked because I'm out of time. And so name it to tame it helps you start to get distinction between subtle nuance of different feelings of blue and this morning when I woke up, I was definitely in a blue place, but I was really proud of myself because I was able to recognize I'm just drained and tired 
not hopeless despair. Why is that? We often think of drained and tired as bad, but relative to despair, it's actually really good. And how come I'm here and not here? And I think it's because I've done the work to name and tame and, and become more aware of the whole map and remember that I can be here without spinning out into here. What does this bring up for you? Jen, Allison, Kyla, what does this make you think? I'd love to hear while I'm drinking water because you all encouraged me. Boxing and Bulldogs is going to be meditating five times in a row now. I love it. Oh, Jen, reading your words, it feels like true freedom. And I would agree with you. Like it made me feel like I can breathe. Boxing and bulldogs. It makes me think of the secret. Totally, right? The law of attraction. And I, I have total mixed feelings about the secret because I've seen so many people, myself included, beat themselves up for their manifestations just because they were there was a layer deeper down in their human gobstopper that was attracting and it was at odds with what they wanted um, superficially. Jen, email me and I will email you back the map. I'm in process of getting it on my website, but if you email me at info at greentreemind.com, I will gladly get you a copy because this thing is a game changer. I mean, I have it laminated. I use it all the time. I bring it to in-person like talks and we use it. In fact, I even have like um, a twister board and I put it on the floor and I have people stand on it and walk on it and move. It's, I would like this map too. It feels peaceful. Email me and I will delightfully, just like this map sets you free. If you want to get somewhere, I say, I want to get to New York. I can't get directions to New York, and California or Fiji the directions to get to California and Fiji to New York are very different. And so knowing where you're at and telling about it on layers, both superficial and deep of your human gobstopper, knowing those layers and knowing where you're at can start to give you instructions as to where you want to go. Many of us want to heal, but we're stuck in a roller coaster autonomic loop over here. Healing doesn't happen when we're stuck in a despairing pit and only one way out is to get anxious and afraid. He does not work that way. No matter how much you want to think it and believe it and feel it, you need to get your nervous system more comfortable chemically with the green and yellow, more pleasant side of things and or tell the truth about where you're at and find the pleasant here in these lower numbers. Allison would like a map too. Email me info at greentreemind.com and I will get each of you a map whenever you email me with delight and it comes with good energy too. If we want to heal, we need to get our nervous system oriented a little more higher pleasant and get it chemically comfortable over there. And we need to learn to find the pleasant in the lower pleasant sides of life. Because on some level, I think it's true. If you want to live a wholehearted life experience, you got to be able to negotiate the terrain of all of the life experiences that are a normal part of our existence. It's equally bad to get stuck in a yellow green place and not have tolerance for red and blue. The whole of the human experience can be a privilege. You know, a friend of mine said that to me recently, aging is a privilege. And that is so counter to what so many of us think and, and speak and believe. And it's painfully true, especially for me, because my mom died when she was 47 and I'm approaching that age and I'm going to get to age if all things continue to be alive and well. I'm going to get to age and that's a privilege she didn't get to have. And so it's this real mindset shift of aging is a privilege. 
And I think we'll all have an easier time aging if we can navigate our map with a little more flexibility, a little less resistance, a little more skill. That's why I train people to become nervous system ninjas is so that we can navigate this map with more confidence and, and more tools. You know, the average American has three emotions they can name, happy, sad, mad. That's not a lot of neural diversity. And if we want to have a wholehearted, healthy life experience, we need more neural diversity. And there's a hundred names on here. And I'm happy to give you the map. And I'm going to wrap it up there on this Martin Luther King Day. Tell me before you leave, what is your takeaway? What are you receiving from this conversation together that you want to bring with you in your life? Jen, Allison, Kyla, Willeen, Boxing and Bulldogs, what is it that you want to take with you here today and remember for your week, for your life, really? I'm going to think about that question for myself. What is it that I want to take away? Hmm. Hmm. Willene wants to check in with her nervous system regularly, scheduled, like every 15 minutes. Absolutely. Derek Williams, thank you. You just emailed me with a map request. Thank you for emailing me. I will email you back. Boxing and Bulldogs. Woo, good one. My nervous system is connected to my thoughts. Absolutely. All the resistance I had this morning was driving me straight into a blue pit of despair. And that can be changed. Derek is looking to get his nervous system and vagus nerve healthier. Oh, you know, a flexible nervous system is a resilient nervous system. And when we have flexibility to change the vagal states, Derek, you're making me think of a big, um, Jen, I don't know if you're having a garbled connection, just you. Turn off YouTube, restart the video, it'll fix it. Derek, you're bringing up this point about the vagus nerve. Here's what I think, according to this map, is really interesting. I said I was going to stop, and now I'm still going. But, Derek, you inspired me. I like the community here. Thanks, Kyla. Thanks, Jen. Okay, looks like I'm back on. So the vagus nerve is really governing lower energy states. And our sympathetic arousal is governing higher energy states. And so I think about the vagus is like the break and the sympathetic arousal is like the gas. So this here is your gas pedal and this here is your brake pedal. And it's good to know how to drive your car, right? Your human system that thinks, feels, and behaves how do you drive it through life using your gas and your brake effectively? So what happens for many people is that their vagus nerve is not fully myelinated. It's deconditioned. It's atrophied, specifically the ventral part of the vagus. And the ventral part of the vagus is much more responsible for the higher pleasant sensations, experiences, and healing, higher pleasant. And the dorsal vagus, the older, more primitive vagus, is responsible for the lower energy, um, uh, lower pleasant. Remember, the whole of it is still pleasant, but ventral is far more green, and dorsal vagus is far more blue. And so if Derek's looking to get his nervous system healthier. I think the two things that are important for you is to be able to learn how to shift 
from blue more into green. And then the second piece is finding the pleasant in the blue. Because if you can find the pleasant in the blue, it can act like a facilitator to, to help you slide further up the pleasant scale, right? It's like if I need to slow down because life is high and my ventral vagus isn't working, my dorsal will always take over. And it's like slamming on the e-brake when all you need to do is just lower your speed five miles an hour. You don't need to go from 60 to zero, but that's what happens. And that's why it drives um, dis-ease in people's health is because they don't have a good balance between the different types of brake pedal, like the finesse of I can slow down versus ah, all I can do is hit the e-brake. So that's how I use this with generating more health in the nervous system and the vagus is becoming aware of where you're at and, and what you can do. And so I just encourage you to watch your system and watch yourself. Email me if you'd like a map. I really enjoyed being here today with all of you. And it's definitely getting easier and easier to find the pleasant in blue and to shift from tired over into relaxed. It's just one over. And that's really hopeful. So Jen, Allison, Kyla, Derek, Chris, Willine, thank you all for being here today. I will be here again next Monday. Um, come with questions. I always welcome them. And you can always email me if you want me to talk about a specific topic. I would be so delighted to do that. So Jen, thank you. I appreciate you too. I wish all of you an inspired Monday on this Martin Luther King day and may the peace of that man touch us all because it's a time where we need it for sure. So thank you all and we'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs>